All right. Well, it's good to be here, folks. Good to be here. Amen. And uh, I hope when we launch out into the deep today, have something to say that'll that'll uh, that'll help. Turn to Isaiah chapter number fourteen. And verse number 12. Father, I pray now you'd help me, Lord. As I get up here and I try to teach, I need wisdom, I need understanding, I need the anointing gift of the Holy Ghost. In thy holy name, Father, in thy name we pray, amen. Okay. I'm going to deal with a subject this morning that... Uh, a lot of times people don't want to deal with and that's uh, that's some of the things that pop up in the Bible that you've got to look at because this is um, very important Isaiah chapter number 14 verse 12 how art thou fallen from heaven O Lucifer son of the morning how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations now if all you had was a King James Bible you would, uh, you'd never know there's anything going on here. Or if all you had was just an English Bible or something of that nature, just a Bible. You, uh, you would never suspect there's anything going on. Here's the problem. That word Lucifer is a Latin word. All right, now digest that for just a moment. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew and a few places in Aramaic. All right. Hebrew predates Latin, no question about that. Hebrew is one of the old problems. Bullinger says that Hebrew is the original language. But anyway... Hebrew is an old language, ancient. The Hebrew word here is Hillel. And that word means morning star. Now, the morning star is called that because it appears in the morning right before the sun comes up. It's the brightest star in the sky. But star is a misnomer. It's not a star, it's a planet. And it's the planet Venus. The Latins and the Greeks and all of them, they understood this. And they had various names for it, Lucifer, Venus. It's the name of a planet. Now the word Lucifer itself means light bearer, all right? Light bearer or light bringer, which would probably be more technically correct for this because being the brightest planet in the sky right before the rising of the sun, it's bringing the sunlight. See the connection? All right, that's Lucifer. Now here's the rub. Verse two or three. Rub number one, what is a Latin word doing in a Hebrew Old Testament? Rub number two, why is it that the whole church today and the, most of the world for that matter, when they see the word Lucifer, they immediately associate it with what? The devil, Satan, okay? So you got two big things going on here. And uh, to get them nailed down right will help us as we can move along. All right. Now, as I said to you, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. And I told you about the Masoretic text, the Masorites, who were responsible. They mainly were, were uh, uh, located in Tiberias, which is on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. And the, the Masorites were responsible to see to it. They had a fence to the scripture, which is called the Masora. They saw to it that every word was copied correctly, exactly in location. They counted, you've heard that many times, how they counted all the letters, the location of it, all the punctuation and everything. And of course, it's jots and tittles. It didn't have any vowel points. They added the vowel points. Now, so how did a Latin word wind up in the Hebrew Bible? In other words, if we had cut, so let's say, for example, I take the Old Testament Hebrew text and I translate it Okay, if I translate Hillel, how am I going to translate that? Well, if I translated it morning star or uh, bringer of light or something like that, I would be giving a literal translation of what the Hebrew, Hebrew word Hillel means. Okay, that would be a literal translation from Hebrew into English or whatever, whatever language we're going to do. Now, right? But that's not what we've got. We've got Lucifer. Now, these people, and let me read their info, let me read some of their quotes again, because I'm going to show you the controversy that's going on today. It's always good to, to see what the other side's thinking. Uh, 
Manly P. Hall is an occultist, and he says, when the Mason learns the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he's learned the mystery of the craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. So now it's obvious that they do not approach Lucifer as a wicked, vile spirit. The idea is that they are looking way past and way above the Bible, which they say is a corruption of Jewish uh, uh, superstition and Christian superstition, and that in order to get to the truth that you've got to look past the Bible, and this is what causes someone like uh, Albert Pike to say this, that which we must say to the crowd for public consumption is we worship a God, but it is the God that one adores without superstition. See the superstition? That's us. To you, sovereign grand inspectors general, we say this, that you may repeat it to the brethren of the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. The Masonic religion should be by all of us initiates of the higher degrees, watch the wording carefully, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. If Lucifer were not God, would Adonai, whose deeds prove his cruelty, perdiphy and hatred of man, barbarism and repulsion for science, would Adonai and his priest calumniate him? Yes, Lucifer is God, and unfortunately, Adonai is also God. Now we've got yin-yang. Here we are. We're back to the principle. Now look what he's saying. Look what he's saying. He is saying the God of the Old Testament of the Jew is a wicked, vile, petty, territorial, tribal God. And that the Christians have taken that God and they've elevated him to a status that he never deserved to be elevated to. And because of that, the true God, which is Lucifer, has paid a dear price because they have made Lucifer into a evil, vile God that is nowhere to be found in the Old Testament. Now, if you talk to a Jew, if you go to the Jewish um, uh, encyclopedia, and you read what they have to say about uh, the devil, for example. They will tell you, most of them will say, there is no devil. They'll say the idea of a personal devil is nothing in the world more than a religious superstition. That's all it is. And, and, and the day that we are freed from that ignorant religious superstition will be the greatest day indeed for mankind. Now that's the idea that's coming from these people. Now folks, we're going to deal with the Bible here in a minute, but I'm trying to lay a foundation for you to show you how these people think. And so when I get up and preach a message about the devil or about Satan or about Lucifer, uh, they, they kind of chuckle in the background and think that poor ignorant preacher down there, that redneck Baptist preacher, you know, he, if he knew anything, he wouldn't be up there preaching about the devil. There is no devil. And he wouldn't be in all this and that and so forth and so on. You know, I mean, sure, they got all kinds of terms for us. That hillbilly that just crawled out from a, a, a moonshine still back here in the woods somewhere. You know, here he is up here, inbred. You know, there's a lot of that. Oh, yeah, a lot of that inbred and uh, all kinds of stuff. You wouldn't believe what a lot of folks in the higher echelons of American culture believe about hillbillies. <laughs> hillbilly. <laughs> well... <laughs> I know one thing, I've known some good ridge runners. <laughs> Amen. God's got his people, whether they're running ridges or walking down uh, Madison Avenue in, Chicago, or in New York. He's got his people everywhere. Okay, now we've got a general idea. Eliphaz Levi, which was a Jew, Eliphaz Levi. When you see the name Levi, L-E-V-I, Kohen, Kohen, in a man's name, the Hebrew word for priest in the Old Testament is Kohen. And you see Kohen, C-O-H-E-N, you're looking at somebody who is a Jew. Now this is not to denigrate Jews, but this is to show you that there is a uh, connection with the names. And he is the one who resurrected the idea of Baphomet, and which is the androgynous God, 
which is both male and female, he resurrected that and he made a, and he made a graphic of it. And that graphic has been the most popular thing you'll find today when it comes if you're trying to run a thing on Baphomet. But here's what he said. Quote, what is more absurd and more impious than to attribute the name of Lucifer to the devil? That is to, pers that is to personified evil. In other words, when people talk like this, let me, let me say this. When somebody's talking about, you know, evil, all right, a lot of people will, will admit that there is an evil principle of some kind, that we haven't evolved enough past that, so there's an evil principle. But when you put that into a person, you've personified evil. In other words, if I say we have a devil, then we have a personification of evil. Just like when I say the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the personification of holiness. That's exactly right. We're not talking about principles and influences now. We're talking about real beings that exist. Now listen to Eliphaz. What is more absurd and more impious than to attribute the name of Lucifer to the devil? That is to personify evil. The intellectual Lucifer is the spirit of intelligence and love. It is the paraclete that's the one who goes alongside of, translated advocate in the New Testament. He is the paraclete. It is the Holy Spirit where the physical Lucifer is the great angel of universal magnetism. What's he done now? What's going on here with these men? When they say on one hand, when, when Albert Pike says, he says, both Adonai and Lucifer are God. I have to understand Albert Pike's concept and definition of God, don't you? And then when he comes along and he says that, and when Eliphaz Levi says that the Lucifer is really and literally the Holy Spirit. See what's happening. Now it's important to understand the thinking of these people. Because if you understand their thinking, you'll understand the basis and foundation of satanic deception. Because we have to take what the Bible says, and if the Bible uses a term, I'm going to stick with it. Say, so then you're going, to, you're going to stick with the Latin term Lucifer in Isaiah. Yes, sir, I am. All right, so let's go back and find out where it came from. When you go back into the history of the Bible, you'll find out that within the first 300 or so years after Christ, in the old Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, you'll find that the term Lucifer shows up for the first time in this passage in Isaiah chapter number 14. And you go back and you begin to read the writings of the church fathers and you'll find out men like Tertullian, others, firmly believed that Lucifer was the devil. And that this passage in Isaiah 14 was talking about the devil or Satan. Now I have to make a choice. I have to make a decision. I've got to make a decision. Am I going to accept what these men say or am I going to reject it and say, well, hold on, this is a mistranslation because this would be a classic mistranslation of the Bible because the word Lucifer should never show up a Latin term in a Hebrew text. What's going on here? So you've got to make a decision. You've got to make a choice. You see, the King James Bible you've got in your hand, that authorized version, what word does it use in Isaiah chapter number 14? Lucifer. Lucifer, that's what you've got there. You've got Lucifer, which could have been translated morning star. Now, I want you to think with me for a minute. The Lord Jesus is called the bright and morning star, Revelation, <laughs> right? And Lucifer here in Isaiah chapter number 12, the wording is a little different. He's called what? Son of the morning. All right, now look carefully. They essentially mean just about the same thing. What have we got? We've got a counterfeit to the truth. We've got the true Christ and a false Christ. You see, these men looked far deeper than simply the translation of a word. They wanted to see who are we really talking about over here in Isaiah chapter number 14. That's the key. Who are you talking about? Now, here's the defenders of the Latin thesis, the idea that the Latin should never be there. Their, their, their thesis is that this context of Isaiah 14 is talking to the king of Babylon, an earthly ruler. 
And so why in the world would you stick Lucifer in there that has nothing to do with the Babylonian king? That's the idea. I take the same position that Tertullian and the rest of them took, and that is God might be addressing an earthly king, but he's speaking far past an earthly king to a much more sinister and higher being than an earthly king. And I'm going to show you how the Bible does that. That's not a, that's not a unique thing to Isaiah chapter number 14. It shows up over and over again in the scripture. For example, over here in the book of, uh, uh, in the book of Luke, let's see, here it is. Uh, let me find my text. Matthew, Matthew chapter number 11 and verse number 14. Matthew eleven fourteen. 14. If I could keep stuff organized, I'd be dangerous. <laughs> Matthew eleven fourteen. 14. I get up to walk to the other end of the house and forgot what I got up for. Whew. Matthew eleven fourteen. 14. You ever stop in the middle of the house and say, what am I doing here? <laughs> Matthew eleven fourteen. Now watch this. If ye will receive it, this is who? But who's he talking about? John the Baptist. So one person can stand for another person. That's a principle of scripture. All right. One can stand for another. Now, in Matthew chapter number 16, verse 23, look at this one carefully now. And think on this one when you read it. Matthew 16, 23. But he turned and said to Peter, he's talking directly to Peter, all right? He's talking to Peter, the apostle, get thee behind me, Peter. I messed up, didn't I? What did he say? He's not talking to Peter. He's talking to the one that uh, Peter's representing. There's a higher one there than Peter. See what I mean? This is a direct confrontation of the Lord Jesus with, uh, with, uh, with Satan. Now, the a book of Ezekiel, chapter number 28, and verse number 13. Ezekiel 28, 13. An awful lot is revealed about God, folks. I'll just put this in here. This is not something I had in my notes, but this is something that I've learned from study. An awful lot is revealed about the nature and person of God during the captivity in books like Ezekiel. It's revealed about his sovereignty and about his glory and about his majesty. And the reason for that is because the children of Israel are off in Babylonian captivity where they spent 70 years and they need encouragement about their God because if our God is so great and our God is so sovereign, what are we doing over here in Babylon? See, and so he reveals these things to them. But in Ezekiel chapter number 28 and verse number 13. Let me get in the right book. Ezekiel 28, 13. Now watch this carefully. Verse 12, he said, Son of man, take up a lamentation to who? All right, the king of Tyrus. All right, the king of Tyrus is the king of an earthly kingdom. Tyre and Sidon. Tyrus, the king of Tyrus. All right. Now, he says, take up a lamentation against the king of Tyrus. But watch the context of this carefully. And say to him, thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom, perfect beauty. Now, watch this. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now, hold on a minute. How in the world could this earthly king have been in the Garden of Eden? See what I mean? He's addressing the king of Tyrus, but there's no way in the world that this context is going to fit an earthly man. He's talking to somebody bigger than him. He's talking to somebody that's been around a whole lot longer than him. And notice carefully the wording, too. In verse number 13, Ezekiel 28, the last phrase the pipes prepared in thee in the day that thou wast what? Created. Created. Satan is a created being. But we have passed from generation to generation to generation. 
God created the first Adam, but he didn't create me. I came from the first Adam. Then the last Adam showed up and I was born again from the last Adam. But this creature, like the five cherubim, like the angels, like the seraphim, these are creatures that have been created by the direct hand of God. So I see that my, and very clearly to me that the king of Tyrus in no way fulfills what's talking about here when he's talking about him being the Garden of Eden. All right, now that's three examples to show you how when the Bible is speaking to somebody that it's obvious that it's speaking to somebody greater than that individual that's involved right there personally. So the argument from Isaiah chapter number 14 that the king of Babylon is the fulfillment of all going on there won't hold water. There's a whole lot more going on in Isaiah chapter number 14 than the king of Babylon. Now here's an interesting thing, and I just caught this this morning when I was, when I was uh, reviewing some of my notes. I've never seen it before, and I thank the Holy Ghost for showing it to me. What are the three languages that were nailed to the cross on top of Christ, on the Titleists? What were those three languages? That's it. Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Three names, three, three languages. <clears throat> There are three names for Satan in the Bible. Lucifer, Satan, and the devil. Lucifer, pure Latin. Satan, Satan, Satan. That's a Hebrew word. Devil is Diablos. That's a Greek word. The three languages that are used to describe the devil are Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. And when the Lord Jesus is nailed on the cross, guess what three languages go over the top of his head? Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Why is it? Why is that? It is because that the difference between the true Christ and the false Christ can only be discerned by the power of the Holy Ghost of God with this book opened. This is why the Bible says that Satan is no marvel. He transforms himself into an angel of light. Now think about it. The angel of light is Lucifer. The adversary is Satan. The slanderer and accuser is the devil. But they all three refer to the same being. He, only, he has three separate manifestations of his person. He's called a dragon. In the book of Job, he's referred to as behemoth and leviathan. He's referred in different ways throughout the Bible, but it's the same being. And here's why. There's five cherubim in the beginning, five of them. One fell. How do you know he's a cherub, preacher? Because in Ezekiel 28, when he's addressing the king of Tyrus, he said, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Now, you know, people just have to, they just have to take the book and throw it out and say, well, you know, that's really, that's just symbolic. It's not symbolic of anything. It's not the king of Tyrus, it's a cherubim. And Satan is not a fallen angel. You hear that all the time. He's a fallen angelic creature. If you use angel in the generic sense, in the generic sense simply meaning a creature of the heavens that dwells where God dwells, then I will accept angelic. But his actual being, he's a cherubim. And the cherubim is a plural Hebrew noun. Any word that ends in im in Hebrew, seraphim, anakim, cherubim, anakim, these are plural Hebrew nouns. And they mean three or more. The first time a plural Hebrew noun shows up in your Bible, it's in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, Elohim created bara, the heavens and the earth. That is a generic term, Elohim. That's not his name. It simply means a spirit being. Demons are Elohim in the Old Testament. So there's nothing particularly holy about that. But when Moses said, tell me your name, I am that I am. And then when he brought Abraham into a relationship with him, I am the Lord God Jehovah. He brought in the Tetragrammaton, 
the four sacred Hebrew letters, Yod, He, Val, He. These four Hebrew letters, as I've told you so many times before, are the actual name of God, and it brings him into a covenant relationship with man in the Old Testament. Anybody that has studied any Hebrew at all, they know that Aleph, Baith, Gimel, Daleth, He, that's the first five letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Do you know what the sixth one is? Vow. Do you know what it looks like? How many's ever seen that? You've seen that it looks like a, kind of like an M? You've seen it all over the place in the windows, the windshields? That is literally six, six, six. That's not a mistake. They knew when they put that up there that they were taking the sixth letter from the Hebrew alphabet. Hebrew now. Now, Hebrew and Greek uh, 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 are, uh, what's the word I say here? How do you say it? Are definitely uh, languages that the letters are represented by, the, by numbers. numbers the letters represent a number. In other words, Aleph is one, Baith is two, Aleph, Baith, Gimel, three, and so forth. But not English. And so you're pushing and stretching the point when you try to take A, B, C, D, E, F, G and attach it to a number. Sometimes it may work out and all that. I don't pay much attention to that. But buddy, when it gets into Greek and Hebrew, I do. Because Gematria is all over it. And that name Jehovah, yod Hey vau Hey, is the name of God. And that name is the ineffable name of God, the unpronounceable name of God. That's the Almighty that we worship. The Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Lord Jesus of the New Testament. He's our God. Now I'm a Bible believer and I'm a Christian. I believe that. And that's why I preach it to you. I believe that the God of the Old Testament is the true and living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But this stuff here about Lucifer, this is a different thing entirely. These people are so far removed and so far different from you that it's not funny. We have absolutely nothing in common with these people. When anybody begins to praise Lucifer, you're dealing with somebody who has, who has discarded the Old Testament thrown it out and, and talking about this. Now, how many remember what a demiurge is? All right. I was watching a documentary this morning for a few minutes and they were talking about the Knights Templar and they went into Chartres Cathedral over there in France. And they came in there and they were talking about how that these Knights Templar were worshipers of the Virgin, that they literally exalted the Virgin above Christ. Well, that's not unusual. You know, in some places, they've got a virgin up there on the crucifix instead of the Lord Jesus. But that's a different thing. You know, if you've done any study at all, that the virgin is Isis. That the virgin Mary in the Roman Catholic Church is the queen of heaven of, Is of the book of, of Jeremiah. All right, that's who it is. That's the queen of heaven. All right. Now that goes back. Once again, I want to take you back with me because we're going to find out why this is the way it is. Hundreds of years before Christ, Plato, a Greek philosopher, believed in a universal spirit. He believed in the spirit that, that was everywhere in all men. This is why they say, you have, you ever, have you, how many have ever heard a liberal progressive Christian talk about a spark of divinity? All right? Like you've got a spark of divinity. That's where it comes from. It comes from the idea that we all have Godhood potential within us. All right. He believed that this universal spirit that cannot be known personally, it's just an it's a it's a, it's a it's a presence, it's a force like the god of forces in the book of Daniel. It's a force. This universal spirit has manifested itself or has had emanations coming forth from it that men relate to and one of them is Lucifer. One of them is Sophia. And one of them is the Christ spirit. Of course, they say that the Lord Jesus Christ of the New Testament was, a, was anointed by this universal spirit. This is why a New Ager can so freely talk about the Lord Jesus. And you'd think he knows, he or she knows the one you believe in. And yet they are not talking on the same level at all. When a New Ager and progressive Progressive liberal Christianity is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. They're talking about the Christ anointing spirit that came forth from that, that spirit of, of Plato 
that, that comes in and anoints because the Christ spirit, if you'll remember in the first century after Christ, some of the worst heretics that ever lived, Socinian was one of them, a Socinian heretic, believes this. He believes that the man that lived 2,000 years ago in this world, that man, was just a man like you and me. But that Christ spirit that we're talking about came on him. And therefore he became a great teacher, great leader, founded a great religion. But when he went to the cross, now this is important. When he went to the cross to die, that Christ spirit left him. And he died just a man. That's the same crowd, folks, that believes that Lucifer is the true God. They believe that Lucifer is eminently above your Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's what you're getting into with this stuff. Now, how many of you follow me so far with all this stuff I've been, you know, I come at this from a lot of different directions, try to lay it out here and make some sense out of it. To give you an idea of what we believe and why we believe it and what you're dealing with when you come up against liberal Christianity. There's not a liberal, there's not a liberal progressive mainline Protestant denomination Christian in this country that believes in a new birth. Not a one of them. They don't believe in it. They don't believe in it. Not a one of them. They don't believe in it. And every last one of them spend their whole lifetime, if they do any preaching out of the Bible, it'll be from the Sermon on the Mount. It'll be the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven. And that's all you get out of them. Which boils down to how we live and work and relate to each other in this world. That's their theology. That's their doctrine which ultimately boils down to social reform, social work, social helping people, feeding the, feeding the hungry, clothing the people and, and helping the sick. And these are all good things, but these are incidental things. These are things that happen because you're preaching the gospel of Christ. If you see somebody hungry and you want to preach to him, feed him. If he needs clothes, clothe him. But you're not here, you're not here to clean the world up and make it a socially acceptable place to live in. We're here to preach the gospel. Because men need their souls saved far more than they need food in their belly. See? But you got to get in context. You got to understand. You don't want to come across to these progressive liberals as you don't care because you should care. We should care when we see the suffering of, uh, of, of, of our fellow man. But the idea, too, that goes along, that goes directly with this, is the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. That's liberal Christianity. And that's the whole thing in a nutshell. Now, let me go one more time with you before I go further and deeper into this. Lucifer is a Latin word that means light bearer or bringer of light. Like Christopher. You know what that word means? It means bearer of Christ. Lucifer, bearer of light. And uh, so the word Lucifer is a very controversial word. And you're going to find Christians who will challenge you and tell you. And I use the Korean word Christian in a, in a <laughs> I'll be careful but as I use it. That are going to say to you, now why do you have Lucifer a Latin word in your Hebrew Bible that's been translated into English. What's it doing in there? How would you answer them? Well, of course, I went through a big long thing with you at the beginning this morning to, to show you why it's in there. That the Latin Vulgate, the early church fathers, uh, when they got to Isaiah 14 and the king of Babylon, they knew that somebody much bigger than the king of Babylon was being addressed here. And they used this book, they, they used this text over here that the Lord said in Luke chapter number 10, verse 18. Luke 10, 18. They, they used this as the support for what they did. Luke 10, 18. And he said unto them, 
I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now, who said that? Okay. And it brings up this point. We understand Lucifer so far. Let's bring Satan into this. Satan is a Hebrew word. It's a Hebrew word. It's all over the Hebrew Bible. Sometimes it's just transliterated like it is in the book of Job. What's that mean? It means it takes it out of Hebrew letters and just puts it into English letters and you're just reading it the way it says it in Hebrew. And who shows up in the book of Job, which is the oldest book in the Bible? There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and came also. What's he called? Satan. That's 1,900 years before Christ. That's nearly 4,000 years ago, folks. All right. That is old, and that means that they had a knowledge and an understanding at that time that there was a being, not an influence, but a being called Satan. His name means adversary. The Lord Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Did anybody rebuke him when he said that? They accepted what he said on face value because it was a commonly understood thing among the Jewish people 2,000 years ago that there was a being called Satan. See what I mean? Now, you know what I told you about these liberal Jews today who come along and say there is no devil, that it's just an evil influence, that it's part of the yin-yang and all the rest of that. But there is in the Bible a literal being called Satan. Do you believe that? I believe it. Because I believe the Bible. I believe when the Bible says that after 40 days in the wilderness of Judea, that the scripture says that when the Lord Jesus was weak and had been fasting for 40 days, who showed up? Satan. And he talked to him. He communicated. Now, if he's just an evil influence, the Lord's out of his mind, see. He's just talking to something out there that doesn't exist. No, Satan's real. He's real. He is real. In the case of Lucifer, you've got a great deceiver. But in the case of Satan, you've also got a great deceiver. All right. Devil is an active agency. What do you mean by that? It's a real being. It's Satan, but he's doing something. He's a slanderer. He's at work. He's moving about, see. Your adversary, the as a roaring lion, seeketh whom he may devour. He's moving. He's going. But it's Lucifer, Satan, that's thinking, that's, that's, that's planning, that's, that's, uh, that is just like the dialogue in the book of Job where he's talking to God. Where have you been? Been walking to and fro on the earth. Have you considered my servant Job? Oh, I've considered him many times. Oh, you better believe I've thought long and hard about him and about the influence that he has on all these people around here in the east. You better believe I've considered him, but you've got a hedge built about him. I've already tried, and I can't get to him. Now, that's the dialogue. Think about that. You think that dialogue continues today? Well, certainly it does. Have you considered my servant Job? Have you considered my servant Preacher Lawson? Yeah, he has considered me. <laughs> didn't take him near as long to figure me out. I didn't hear, I didn't have near the hedge about me that Job did, and he got through. <laughs> How many's ever had him get through to you? I'll tell you something, folks. I'm serious as I know how to be this morning. If you ever have an encounter with Satan, you'll know it. I'm not talking about the, the, the flesh and the, your flesh will wire you out. It'll give you plenty to worry with and this, this world. And all, but if you ever have a confrontation with Satan, you'll know it. It'll be just as powerful as a confrontation with God, as an experience of God when he comes upon you. Because you see, we get accused of this all the time. This is where liberal progressive, they say, you see that bunch of nuts down there, that, that bunch of ignoramuses, every little problem that comes up in their life, if they get sick or if they have a problem here, they lose their job, it's the devil. You can hear them mocking you. You're blaming the devil for everything that happens in your life. And oh, how they mock and they make fun at that. They, they step back and they say, listen, if you're going to live in this world, you're going to have problems. They're going to come. They're going to come. It's just going to happen. That's the way this world is designed because of the fall 
because of the curse of sin, you're going to have problems. But Satan can multiply them a thousand fold. And you can be sure of this, when Satan enters in to the in, 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 enters into the issue, he'll come in to turn you away from the true and living God because that's what his purpose is. Now, you've got Latin, you've got Hebrew, and you've got Greek. You've got the three major languages that existed 2,000 years ago. Greek, 2,000 years ago, was the language of commerce. Latin, obviously, was the language of the Roman Empire, and Hebrew is the ancient language of the ancient people that, had, that goes all the way back to the beginning. You've got all three methods of communication covered. You've got every way that you can communicate with mankind. You've got it there. It's nailed across the top of his, of his uh, on the titles of his cross. So you've got Lucifer, Satan, and the devil. And they all refer to the same being. But there is a vast difference in the Bible in the way that Lucifer and Satan and the devil are presented. They're all the same one, but the way he works is laid out in subtle differences throughout the scripture. And we'll cover them the next time we meet in this house and get back into this text. We've got about two minutes left. I hope I've said something this morning. Have I said anything today to you that helps you understand the issue of Lucifer a little better now? That's the main thing. Don't worry about the Satan devil part. Get the Lucifer part right. If you get that part right, then you can move on from it. It's, you know, if you, always, if you've got an Achilles heel, you've got a problem, it, they'll all, the devil will always come back and he'll pull that on you and he'll use it against you. And so I hope that when I get done with all of this, that your faith in the Bible will be strengthened. It won't be, it won't be undermined. Last thing I want to do is destroy somebody's faith in the Word of God. Yes, sir. That's the one I'm talking about. All right. Yeah. If you make the vow, you make it like this, okay? It looks, it looks kind of, I don't know what it is in English, uh, but it looks like this, okay? Three of them. That's the sixth letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Six, six, six. Remember, gematria and Hebrew are real. Gematria and Greek are real. Gematria and Latin are real. And so you've got to watch that. Yes, sir. Which one is? M is the 13th letter? <laughs> I hadn't counted that. I didn't know that. Yeah. So those three, three sixes come up with 13. <laughs> yeah, it is. It almost makes you think that there's a mind somewhere way back there in the past that had all this figured out. And it's happening just exactly the way he intended it to. Yes, sir. Uh, this may be a too long of a discussion to start, but I, I was wondering why did the Lord use those terms like King of Persia or Prince of Persia and, and King of Tyres instead of just calling out Lucifer as Lucifer? You know, why did He use these these men as His terminology? Well, immediately what comes to mind is this. Okay. I'm talking to the king of Tyrus, Satan, but I know what you're doing. Okay? I'm talking to this earthly ruler, but I know who the power is behind him. And I know exactly what you're doing. And I want you to understand that I'm going to deal with you on that level. Remember this. Satan's fall was a progressive thing. The last step in Satan's fall from being before the presence of God is the lake of fire. But he didn't fall from the presence of God directly to the lake of fire. He came down in stages. And this is why he said in the book of Genesis, because thou hast done this thing. So let's, uh, yes, sir.
Well, have you, is it, where is that in Isaiah, 45, where it says, I create evil, and I create good? Nothing can exist apart from God, period, period, period. Nothing could come into existence. Nothing could exist apart from that almighty being. Well, it's like Paul said in Ephesians. He said that now by the church of God might be made known the manifold wisdom of God. That the principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places are watching, observing the church and they're learning a lesson. Because what God is doing in the church is a manifestation of his manifold wisdom. And that's, that's, a, that's an amazing thing when you think about it. It's, what it is is we're creatures, but there's a spiritual battle going on above our head. And every once in a while, he'll let us tap into it and understand a little bit about what's going on up there. But they're fighting on a much higher level than we are. This is why it said in Revelation 12, there was war in heaven. <laughs> yeah, yeah, war in heaven on a much higher level than anything here on this earth. So we uh, watch it and learn, take note from it. Brother McLeod, will you dismiss us, please?